So today I'm just heading to London for a studio visit with a fiery twist with the artist Katrin Hanush. The best way to practice art is to take it out into the world, to see how it interacts with different people and multiple contexts. And for me, Katrin Hanush does this expertly. I saw a show of Unsung Kiefer and I was probably like 16. I went home and was like, yeah, I'm gonna make something like that too. <laughs> so quickly came to the point of like, fuck, this is really difficult. <laughs> That's not work. <laughs> From working in asset spaces in Germany to developing innovative techniques that reimagine everyday materials, or creating public artworks across streets and shop fronts, Katrin is an artist with a multi-layered practice, always willing to explore new territories. The last years of my studies, I got together with another bunch of artists and we organized quite a few like projects on the side. Because Halle is a small city, like there were two, three galleries and they were established in their own little way. And I was kind of like, okay, well, we have to create our own opportunities. Still at that time, you would have quite a lot of like abandoned spaces, factories. With that knowledge, like there was like a bigger project like we've been working on for three, four months or something, which was outside of Halle, like in the countryside. A huge mill, like still partly like with the machinery in it. We then decided to take a few floors, started working with materials we found there and had the audience come in. We would work with the local community as well. For them, we were kind of like, what are you doing in the old mill? Like that has been like shut down years ago. So that was kind of like one of the first bigger or longer like site responsive works. So with that bunch of people, some of us like came up with the idea of like starting a project space, first artist run gallery in the city, which has not been done before. Actually like it's behind you on the table, there's a project space that we had for four years, it was called Die Schöne Stadt. In English it would be like the beautiful city, which Halle as a city was not at all. That was like a big project that kept us busy after we graduated organize shows, invite other artists, have exchanged program with other artists run spaces. It was just like good to see that like with a bunch of people you can set up quite a lot of good energy and we would draw a good audience as well. It became like a social meeting point in a way. It's part of the team. Um, well that, <laughs> that's an interesting thing. <laughs> <laughs> we were 11 and then wow. 12 and then 13 or something. A group of 11, low hierarchy and how do we make decisions? It was fucking difficult. Or it was always like the same people, mainly the men. At some point there was a bit like, hang on a minute. Some people may have other ideas and they never really get heard. And then group dynamics started to become interesting. <laughs> but I would never, never ever run a project with that many people. It was quite often the case that then one would organize to create a show and would be supported by another two or three of us. It also then just naturally happened that people would move away and then the whole question mark was in moving on without that. Well, what do we do? I mean, I didn't have like that much of my own art practice while I was part of that gallery. It took me quite a long time to actually like figure out as well like what kind of studio I need and like now slowly I'm actually getting there. After closing the space in Halle and with an excitement to once again stretch her artistic practice, she landed in London, finding her footing through the sculpture course at the Royal College of Art and expanding the range of her output through shows and residencies. Catherine soon landed on materials and techniques that grew into an alluring visual world. So with a practice like that I have, like I see it as quite broad and like there's the traditional stuff in some ways and then repurposing materials like the LED laptop screens that I've been using since 2017. I had worked on some digital collages and because they were all made on the screen, I thought like, well, it would be ideal if they had a light box. I looked into the light boxes that you can like get made and I was like, oh my God, they're so expensive. I have to find a way to make myself. So I came across various people using alternative light sources and one of the guys would use LED laptop screens that were damaged and you can take things apart, you have to solder a few elements to it and then they would light up. So I went around to a few shops here, computer shops, and asked like if they have any broken computer screens. But I got a hold of like my first whatever 20, 20 something screens and got my solder iron out and kind of like got into setting that up. It was kind of like a nice learning curve and like all the notes from that time like I still like have them open when I go back into soldering. Even though I had my screens then on the wall and I hung my digital collage <laughs> in front of it and it would light up and I was like yeah that's all right but actually like take that away I really like that already. I already noticed that the various screens would actually light up in slightly different colors so there's pastel pink, purple, green, blue, orangey, yellow and relatively neutral 
white one. I started using like the old solder station that I um, inherited from my brother. And that's like another part of my practice that probably will always be like an influence. My brother died when I was 19, like he had an a snorkeling accident and then he was always like the, the crazy professor in the family he would like build all sorts of stuff from like electronics and repair things his space was always like full of resistors and like all the elements that you have on a circuit board i feel quite at home with it i was invited to a residency in spain by pangea sculpture center i took in my suitcase maybe some 30 screens or something with me. Get there and I had not set it up anywhere and it was like a remote area of Spain. It was kind of like meant to be like an outdoor work and I've not really done any outdoor work in that way. Then having like my few screens and running through the landscape with the idea of like, well, where, where would I put them? And the idea was to connect them to like some solar panels that charge a battery and then from the battery, the screens would be powered. The work was called The Return. The sun would charge the battery during daytime and then at nighttime screens send light back to the sun because like they don't have volume they're all flat so like I need to give them some backing some space like where they can actually be seen and like just found like a little curved spot laid them out and um, set up like the solar panels and because it's like an area that is very remote there was literally no light pollution it would just be a very bright strong light beaming up like a beautiful night sky and you would see it from afar and it's like hmm, quite like that it is about an idea bigger than what you look at. Losing my brother early was not a great experience, but it also made me think about the whole transformation of material. I've seen like his dead body and like I've noticed like how the body has changed and like how materiality is subject to change. With the screens, they used to show information, videos, whatever, and we would look at that and then suddenly maybe we, we crack it and then we notice like, oh shit, my screen doesn't work and this rupture in a way where something stops to function. It's a moment when we then actually notice like the physical side of things. There are so many like subtle differences. If you have loads of them you notice it and you kind of like well I can enjoy it in a way. There is some history coming from each of them. Away from the gallery space Catra has produced a number of works that take her art into the street. I asked her about where she prefers to exhibit and what effect she thinks these kind of spaces have on the work. I mean, I totally enjoy both sides, let's say, or both locations, because um, they have very different qualities. I mean, white cube gallery space is kind of like very controlled, but also like it means usually you have a very specific audience, a public space where you get like a general audience and they may not have been in touch with much art at all. Everywhere is advertising. And then it's kind of like, hey, there's this a shop window that doesn't want anything of you, but it actually like just projects light, gives you a moment perhaps to just like rest or like stop and enjoy it. There were all sorts of like questions as well, like, well, so what are the screens going to show? No, that's it. <laughs> it's just the screens, it's just the light, and it's just like the subtleties in it. I need both and I enjoy yeah. both. And like once I've done a project like, like Romford, I'm good for some time and I can do, <laughs> move on and do other things again. Yeah. So it's kind of like going between the two. Aside from these artworks, Katrin has also endeavoured to utilise every aspect of these broken screens. And in doing so, has brought out to the public in surprising ways. Some screens that I get and I cannot repair them, I take them apart and they consist of like these various layers of like plastic film. Some are like diffusers. They have quite an interesting effect. I could make outfits from it. So I then just like um, started making simpler outfits from webbing just to have like a simple construction and then found ways of rivet or mount these plastic sheets to it. And the first one I did wear it myself. It was in Spain so in a way I felt like I'm far enough away <laughs> from home and whatever happens like it may not come back. Yeah, home. Yeah, yeah. Never see this. So it was kind of like good to test and like see what potential it has. So I had a little battery that I would pull with me to light up the screens that I had and like it was kind of like Betty and me. People responded with laughter and they were interested and kind of like, hey, what's that? What are you doing? And it was like nice to get that response. And from that, I then developed two more outfits worked with several performers who would actually wear them. And I had them during an art weekend in 2019.
finally, we talked about her new venture, developing a foundry within her studio space, widening the possibility of her own practice whilst opening avenues to collaborate with other practitioners. The whole idea with the foundry was it would be nice to have casting facilities myself, but I usually would go on residencies and cast. Then with the pandemic being stuck in London in my studio, how about I just make my own equipment? I was talking to some people within the foundry family and they supported me with knowledge of like how to make certain equipment and I got the material together and start building everything. Another learning curve there as well of like failures and like okay this doesn't work and redoing it. It took way longer than I thought. I made my own burner, I made my own furnace, I made my own kiln. So I have so many tools and details and stuff to make and to order and set up and learn about. But it's also a bit like at times so I was just like oh it takes so long. I started, I think, like in April or something in 2020, and then I thought I would be done by June, July, have my first pour, which was then, I think, like mid September. But the first pour was successful. I made it also like to a size that I could cast, like to a medium scale, 27 kilos of bronze, which is like roughly like bust size. Anything too small, what am I doing with that? That's kind of like yeah. nonsense. Potentially, I can not only cast for myself, but I know other people who want to cast or who have cast projects. And I would have the first more commercial projects that I would produce. It's another source of income for me. What is important for me as well is that there are loads of foundries out there and they are very often dominated by white males. I've worked in foundries and I've not made necessarily the best experience. I would want the different and I also learned from other women to kind of like invite, be welcoming to loads of people who are intimidated by all the males around. To me it's important that it's like open and it's not about you've got to be strong and muscly, you've got to use your brain. It's just to create like an open foundry in that sense. Like when I was in India in the residency, a lot of like kids have their kites in the sky and loads of that string would, um, would be on the ground and it would always like entangle around your feet like a caster then oops, and plaster made waxes of it and cast it in brass I will very soon write together like some workshops as well. It will be small focus workshops that start perhaps slightly above a beginner level to give people who have already a certain level of knowledge a chance to actually progress and also like to realize some projects that are a little bit bigger already. It will always be a facility that actually like, brings people together. If you've liked this video, give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you in the next one. You can really turn shit not to gold, but into something.